going as we get into this. But questions I've heard over the week that we'll address for sure is what does this mystery infection look like? How is it spread? Is it contagious to people? Is it contagious to cats? How can you protect your dog? What can we do to prevent the disease in general? And any other questions that you might have. So, what's happening? Well, months ago, in the Pacific Northwest, apparently the first cases of this were developing, and um, dogs that um, came in with kennel cough were treated for kennel cough, and they didn't get better. Some of them got really sick. Some of them need to be hospitalized. Some of them actually died. Not good. So, in the course of all of this, we see that Kennel cough in general is a uh, kennel cough in general is a severely highly contagious infectious disease of multiple bacterial, viral, mycoplasma, even rickettsial origins that your dog can come in contact with. It's characterized um, old-fashioned, classic kennel cough is characterized by an infection in the upper airways. Um, dogs, uh, dogs at risk are primarily where dogs are congregated closely. Kennel cough, so kennels, boarding kennels. Indoor boarding kennels, high on the list. Doggy daycare basically is the same thing except they're in and out, actually more transient, probably higher risk because of the big turnover in populations and large concentrations. I know daycare centers here where there are 50 dogs in a combined area. Good play, good time for catching an infection. So boarding kennels, daycare, rescue centers, dog parks, dog events, dog show trials and competition, grooming parlors, and the like. You can even get it walking down the street if your dog comes nose to nose with a um, uh, with a carrier, basi uh, carrier patient. Symptoms. Symptoms of Oh, it's working. So, symptoms. Symptoms of classic kennel cough. Out of the blue, almost like breakfast are normal and at 10 o'clock in the morning you get that leash on to go outside and all of a sudden you get this dry, harsh <coughs> type cough. Most of the time, nothing comes up. Sometimes if it's going on for a while, you get this white, foamy stuff that comes out. You get this retching that keep right on going. A lot of owners think that um, Fido's got something stuck in its throat. I've got to turn off my cell phone monitor. Got something stuck in its throat. And we'll get calls. Um, po Poopsie's got something stuck in its throat. I can go, oh, they've got to need to come right on that. We'll come right on that. Turns out they've got a, a bronchitis and an upper respiratory infection. So possible appetite loss, fever possible, uh, eye or nose discharge possible to start out with. But to start out with, these dogs aren't that sick. They're just not that sick. They're coughing up a lung. They sound terrible, but they don't feel that bad. And classic kennel cough um, patients, many times, if you put them on the right protocol to prevent other types of illnesses happening, like pneumonia, they don't need hospitalization. They, many patients actually never make it to the, to the veterinary office because they get better all by themselves. One of the th risks that most people aren't talking about is breed risks. Classic kennel cough, this disease whatsoever. Coughing in a Bernese Mountain Dog, which I have owned, I'm proud to own a mini flock of, is not that big of a deal for chronic debilitating diseases developing long term. Your 10 pound Chihuahua, your 10-pound Pomeranian, uh, Poodle, Miniature Terrier, Min Pin, whatsoever, they have a severe potential problem. What is that? What is that, you ask? Well, they got a tiny little windpipe. Their trachea, their windpipe can be about as big as this pen sometimes. And if that gets inflamed and that gets swollen and starts wiggling, it can, it can collapse and it can get, can get damaged just from coughing. It can get damaged just from coughing and it can get damaged permanently. So if you've got a young little dog that's got an 18-year-old life expectancy and he gets a nasty little virus and starts coughing and he gets a weakened trachea it, and he gets a condition we call collapsing trachea, as he develops older in his life, his lifespan, which should be 18, is going to get shrunken down to almost nothing. That condition 
is almost, I won't say impossible, that's bad. I'll say extremely rare is the breeds that go up and up and up and up and up in size. Great Danes, Bernese Mountain Dogs, large breed dogs, uh, 60, 70, 50, 40 pound dogs just doesn't happen. I don't think I've seen a collapsing trachea and a dog 25 pounds or more, maybe 20. So cough begets cough. And if your kid has any cough, even if it's a mild kennel cough, and you're the owner of one of these small breed dogs, you got to get it fixed now. End of that lecture. So um, if the symptoms progress, if the symptoms progress, what happens? Well, the, um, the symptoms get worse, appetite starts dwindling, fever may be happening, you may get more and more eye or nasal discharge, not necessarily. The dog now feels bad. Fido feels absolutely crummy, doesn't want to do anything, doesn't want to eat. He might start having breathing problems. One thing I urge you to do, whether in this crisis or whatsoever, you need to be familiar you need to be familiar with your dog's normal patterns. And when that normal pattern goes south, you can pick it up. In this case, we're not talking about his normal appetite or his normal drinking or his normal peeing or his normal pooping. We're talking about his normal breathing. We're talking about his normal breathing. So when you look at your dog from across the room and he's walking around, you think, and when you think, well, Dr. B says, look at your breathing. I can't see if he's breathing. I should worry. No. <laughs> no. The normal dog, um, um, at first blush, you're not aware of its breathing. It's not loud. It's not labored. It's quiet. The lungs are going up and down. You take a deep breath and you step back and you look at him. Oh, yeah. So his lungs are going up and down, up and down. If you look closely at the silly camera, you can see that I am breathing and my lungs are going up and down. And I might be hyperventilating because I'm excited about this topic. I'm talking relatively fast, and I could be breathing more rapidly. But my breathing is always coming from the chest. My breathing is always coming from the chest. The, the normal canine breathing, of the, when the dog's breathing, is coming from his chest. The first thing with labored breathing are things that when it starts going bad, why do they go bad? Starting to get pneumonia. We don't like pneumonia, do we? So when they start getting pneumonia, breathing will start happening back in the abdomen. We call it abdominal respirations or mixed respirations where respirations are coming from the chest and the abdomen. So if you see your dog's abdomen moving back and forth with his breathing, he's got a breathing problem. Whether he's coughing or not, he's got a breathing problem. So when any of those things are happening, veterinary invention goes from I should I, should I, to yes, you should have yesterday. So mitigating factors. Start out with poor health. Not a good outcome. If you got a, a senior, well, take a people uh, with COVID or when all that stuff started. If you got a senior with influenza and, um, and a bad heart and you give them COVID, not likely to have a good outcome. So if you've been on top of your preventative care and the dog's healthy, your patient's healthly, and you get a, a, a hopefully a mild infection or something, even the bad disease, your chances of a good outcome are higher and higher and higher. We like higher and higher and higher, not lower and lower and lower. Um, vaccination lapses can, uh, we're going to talk about vaccinations here shortly, but vaccination lapses can make you, can increase the risk for FIDO. And stress, stress in the household, you can uh, name 500 times more stresses that you might have than I have, but stress in the household is going to reduce resistance, increase your risk, and give you other problems. The other issues are environmental and extremes in temperatures and humidity. Here in Southern California, we have Santa Ana's and the, the, the relative humidity drops to 15% around my house. Next week, we get rain and it's at 85. So all that fluctuation things uh, increase the risk and the problems. But environments that are high in humidity are going to have a higher risk for transmitting this infection. Go back to your boarding kennels. Go back to your um, the, the daycare facilities. Um, and rightly so, they're using water to hose things down, clean things. They have sanitation problems. They try to stay on top of that. I'm not criticizing them. That's one of, their, one of their methods. It's a pretty good method for sanitation. But the humidity's up. And you've got dogs in closed spaces. The humidity's up. The ability for aerosol droplets to be in the air and swim around. And Fido just comes along and goes, <laughs> I'm going to get something. And you got a problem. So... Um, we're seeing three clinical outcomes, mild, 
chronic, and not good. Um, the first outcome, mild. Um, you get a mild, the chronic bronch, um, um, tracheitis, tracheal bronchitis. That's fancy for the trachea is part of the upper airway, the bronchitis are part of the upper airway. The infection normally resides up in the upper airway. <coughs> Pardon me. The infection resides in the upper airway, and uh, that's the source and trigger for this loud having oh, coughing type, type thing that the kids do. In um, simple uh, um, classic kennel cough, the duration is two to three to four weeks sometimes. But in this condition, the condition can last for sometimes months, six to eight or um, three months or more sometimes. And um, the condition doesn't appear to respond much to anything. And the uh, antitussives and anti-cough medication, yes, particularly for these little, you know, you've got a dog that's normally this size in real life. This dog's got a windpipe this big. You want to protect that at, at all costs. You're going to protect that windpipe on your chihuahua. So, second outcome. Now come in with number two. Outcome number one decides to progress into a severe bronchopneumonia. Um, it's minimally responsive or not responsive to current established protocols, at least protocols months ago. We now have some experience with this, the profession now has some experience with, the, with this disease, and we're using updated protocols to, look, to start treating these kids. We're using it based upon cultures that we get in the early beginning, and we're getting better outcomes, but not perfect outcomes. Um, uh, many of those patients need hospitalization if they go into severe bronchopneumonia. Fluid supportive care, extremely important. So outcome number three, you don't want. The acute, um, some of these patients will develop an acute pneumonia, high fevers, go into respiratory rest and collapse in 24 to 36 to 48 hours, not days. And that's bad, and we're not going to let that happen to your kid. So what do we know? We know that we'd start in the Pacific Northwest, decided to slide to Southern California based upon the reports, um, when I got back from my trip, it was there were 13 or 14 um, states reporting it. Uh, three or four days later, over 30 plus states from Washington uh, and here, the New York and the, and the East Coast, Florida, and everywhere in between. So it's spreading like you would expect, like COVID-19 um, uh, spread through the human population. The same factors that move things around are moving up this virus around. It's potentially everywhere. Um, This is not a reportable disease. By that I mean there are certain statutory diseases that the government, the CDCs, or certain states require that veterinarians and or doctors report to the state health officials because of their serious nature for, con for contagiousness, or in many cases in the veterinary profession, um, in the bovine or um, food production industry, serious economic threats to, uh, to those industries. Anyway, it's not a reportable disease, so no one has to report it. Many county uh, veterinary offices and public health services, LA County, Orange County, et cetera, are uh, requesting veterinarians report the illnesses, but it's not mandatory. So the amount of information coming in is slow and I don't want to say inaccurate, but statistically unreliable. But what we do know is that the insurance companies are reporting a 50% increase in the pneumonia diagnosis over the same period last year. If you look at fall, August, September, October, November um, 2023 compared to 2022 or 2021, they're reporting a, like a 50% increase in cases over those immediate year or two before. The same is for the referral centers uh, uh, in the area. They're reporting a, a, approximately a 50% increase in those um, in the referral centers that are treating pneumonia and severe upper respiratory diseases. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that there's a lot of stuff going on for sure. How accurate that is statistically in the middle of the upsurge in this emerging problem. I'm not going to call this an emerging disease. I chose my words, words correctly. Uh, uh, specifically, we'll talk about emerging diseases here in a second, 
but it's an emerging problem, and the statistics are, um, the numbers are there, the numbers are real, the interpretation, um, I'm going to go out on the limb and interpret that here in a second, but in sum and substance, look at the, 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 the referral centers, well, they got the sickest of the sick, so um, uh, their, their numbers on, on I, I think one of them reported like 5% fatalities in, um, uh, in their cases of severe pneumonia that were presented. That's a big number, um, but considering that their intake population is at the severe end of the curve, the exact mortality rate, I think, has to be significantly lower than that for sure, but exactly where it is in this equation, we don't know right now. So, um, what it's not, well, I don't know if I have a slide, on, on, um, I find that very interesting, um, what it's not. Well, what, it, what it's not, <sighs> my profession no longer uses these, at least technically, the expression kennel cough as a diagnosis. I like the word kennel cough, you understand it, I understand it, the whole world understands it, but we don't call it kennel cough. We call it canine infectious respiratory disease complex. We changed a two-syllable term into 17 syllables because we like syllables. That was a joke. Um, whenever you have a condition, and this is a joke too, but not tongue-in-cheek, but actually pretty accurate. Whenever you have a condition, human, dental, veterinary, it ends in complex, it pretty much means that we don't have a perfect handle on what we're talking about. In the case of, of kennel cough, either classic or this atypical uh, thing that's going on, kennel cough and the infectious, canine infectious, re infectious respiratory disease complex has 33 plus in counting specific recognized organisms that are part of that complex. And most, most patients, if they're well documented, never, strong word coming from me, you know me that well, folks, never have just one. They have multiple problems. We'll get to, the, we'll call, talk the reason of how, how important that is here in just a second. They have multiple problems, but it's a complex. So canine distemper is part of that. Bordetella is part of that. Um, Pneumo uh, pneum uh, pneumonia virus is, is part of that. Canine in, in respiratory coronavirus. Canine, not people, canine respiratory coronavirus is part of that. Um, uh, parinfluenza virus is part of that. Mycoplasma is part of that. Uh, influenza virus, uh, uh, all flavors of influenza virus are part of that. Um, and plus zillions of bacteria. My, uh, other um, multifungal organisms, et cetera, are all part of that. The takeaway is you can prevent some of them for sure. You can prevent none of them. You can, the, uh, the vast majority of that 33, there's no vaccine for, no protection. The only good protection is good health if you decide to get sick. Um, so, what it's not is related to, um, you don't have to read this slide, I'm going to read it real quick, but there's distemper, bordetella, adenovirus, uh, canine herpes, parainfluenza, uh, canine uh, respiratory coronavirus, H -N H2N3 and H2N8, which is the uh, influenza virus, um, mycoplasma, streptococcus equi, and canine pneumovirus. It's not that because that is the diagnostic protocol, the PCR test that's the standard of care, you got a coughing dog, you run that test and see if you got it. Those are all showing up negative 99% of the time for all these atypical dogs with, with killer kennel cough. So we don't, we know it's not that. We know it's something that we've, we've identified in the past. Um, secondly, it's not human COVID-19, because many of these dogs were tested for that in the early stages, worried about that. So it's not that um, uh, illness. So what we can extrapolate for sure is the next data point, which is um, what we can extrapolate for sure, which is the next data point, is that if it's not these things, what else can it be? 
Well, most of these dogs are getting culture for bacteria. And the culture for bacteria sometimes are negative, sometimes are, most of the time, are normal flora. Most of, and what does that mean? Well, normal flora, flora means growth. Um, normal means if you culture my respiratory tract and I'm healthy, yours if you're healthy, the whole family is if it's healthy, most of the time you're going to get some bug. And that's the normal bacteria stuff that's kind of sitting in your system. If you were immunosuppressed, if you get cancer, you get some illness that wipes out your immune system, could one of those bugs pick up and start growing? Yes. Are some of those on the hit list or the 33 uh, um, um, kennel cough and uh, known infections? Yes. Some of them are sitting around the canine's intestinal tra uh, uh, respiratory tract just waiting to have a problem. So if you get sick or, or ill, could one of those give you a problem? Yes, if you get some new illness and you got two or three of those floating around, one plus two plus three could equal a really sick dog, couldn't it? So that's the real picture of pathogenesis of this disease, is that it's not just one thing that they get. Like you go out and get strep throat, you got strep throat, you got antibiotic for strep throat, you get better. Well, the problem with kennel clock is you go out and get one of these things and it tips the teeter-totter in the wrong direction, and you got a problem. You got a problem. So what we're doing um, in our office right now to reduce and mitigate problems is um, we're screening all patients for upper respiratory uh, symptoms uh, on the phone or before they get in the building. Uh, anything that's coughing or sneezing or coughing or gagging or whatsoever, uh, we're triaging them outside. So basically we rolled back all the, the COVID protocol. We're trying to protect you and the staff. Now we're trying to protect the four-legged patients as well as the two-legged patients. And to a certain extent, I'm trying to protect my team. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and we're using standard of care um, updated uh, techniques. This PCR test that we we're talking about, that wasn't available 10 years ago, um, et cetera. And uh, so we're getting good information up front on what we can treat and what we can't treat and what we will treat, um, uh, et, et cetera. The uh, protecting my team actually comes in twofold. I'm worried about their and my own dogs and cats. Um, I'm worried about um, um, s some of the pathogens on that 33 hit parade uh, for uh, kennel cough actually are, are, are pathogens for people. They're uncommon pathogens for people. You have to be sick or immunosuppressed or something to really get one, but you can get it. And so, um, um, one of the possibilities of this infection is that one of those 33 has decided to take uh, uh, steroids or whatsoever and get uh, really big, big and strong and go crazy and give us some problems. The, um, so that's certainly a possibility and I want to make sure the staff is protected. But to date, there are known even suspected cases of people getting sick with this illness. I'll say that again. There are not even suspected cases of people getting sick with this problem. And that's true for cats as well. Um, there are several of the, in, of the infections on the upper respiratory complex thing, Bord Bordetella being primarily uh, one of them. Canine Bordetella infects cats all the time. Canine influenza can infect cats as well. But um, there's no evidence that any of those things are affecting people or cats, period. Um, what I'm doing, my own burners, uh, we've canceled dog shows, the big dog show in Palm Springs uh, that we've uh, dearly loved to go and support and, and hopefully take home a bunch of ribbons from. Um, we're not going um, uh, in January. Um, training classes, no. And um, can't spell distancing, strict, strict social distancing uh, like that. So strict social distancing, translation to when we're walking dogs on the street, no, a bit, no meet and greet with the neighbor's dogs, which they know, or strange dogs, which they may or may not know, because um, I think nose-to-nose -nose contact where they're licking each other and circling each other's butts is a potential uh, risk factor for transmitting this, this disease. So that's what, uh, um, that's what we're doing with them. So um, <sighs> prevention, risk management. Um, most important thing is to pay attention to all aspects of your dog's health. 
Um, most, of my, uh, most of you guys are, are well on top of that. You have your uh, annual exams, your, your vaccines are up to date and whatsoever. I'll come back to it. I'll mention that in a second. Um, but um, um, reducing exposure uh, is uh, very, very, very important. Do I have a slide on vaccines? Yes. Okay. Um, prevention. Um, we group vaccinations into core. I call them the core four, which is distemper, uh, adenovirus, parinfluenza, and parvovirus. So those are the core four. I believe that's consistent with both the American Veterinary Medical Association's recommendations and the American Animal Hospital Association's recommendations. So I'm good there. Um, so the, all, everybody talks about um, non-core vaccinations that can be administered or recommended uh, based upon local circumstances. I personally consider Bordetella a core four uh, or, or my own core five. Reasons for that are highly, um, uh, I feel very strongly about the, that. Uh, there are people that will, will be willing to debate me and there's fine. Bordetella is one of the 33, one of the 33 that has an excellent vaccine. <clears throat> excellent vaccine in 2023. For the last five years, we had an excellent vaccine. For my first billion years in practice, we had a really crummy vaccine. That was the injectable vaccine. The injectable vaccine on a scale of, if this is perfect, worked about this well for about three months and then didn't work very well not at all. Now we've got a vaccine that works super well for at least six months. And so I'm boostering all my patients and I always have for Bordetella every Every, um, every six months. You can argue that Bordetella is just one of the 33. True. You can argue that Bordetella is by itself, Bordetella by itself in the dog. It's a lot more serious than the cat, by the way. But Bordetella in the dog by itself is a pretty mild disease that probably doesn't need to be treated. I'll agree with that. Um, but my reason for being way over the top for wanting Bordetella vaccinations on board 24-7 for all my dogs and all of your dogs is, is, is really distills down to the 2015 influenza outbreak when it hit Chicago. In 2015, it backtracked some dogs from, uh, from Asia, came over there. They were some rescue things that were, um, I think they had their their travel papers uh, forged and 12 other things. That's, neither, that's not beside the, that's beside the point. But they came into Chicago. Influenza erupted in Chicago. Lots of dogs got sick. Many dogs died. Veterinary boarding kennels um, and the shelters and the like shut down. It was just terrible. And then it spread around the country. And we had influenza everywhere. And now we have a good influenza vaccine. And, influ and you know, on, my, on, the, on the list... Where's the pointer? <laughs> Can't point. On the list over there, you got the picture. On the list over there, influenza is a, a not a core vaccine. I'm recommending that now for pretty much everybody with any risk factors. But uh, then the risk factors are: if you're thinking about boarding, if you're thinking if you got a board for the holidays, and the holidays are coming up, whatsoever, got a board for the holidays, got to do this, got to do that. You want board as hell. You want influenza. Don't ask. But the whole, the whole lesson that I learned, the profession, profession should have learned, and dog owners need to know about the fatalities and the many fatalities that occurred in the influenza operation in 2015 in Chicago and around the country, because we had it here in Southern California, they had it in New York, they had it in Florida, they had it everywhere. The lesson we learned when we did autopsies on those poor croaked dogs was they had all kinds of comorbidities. Comorbidities means a bunch of things happening once at the same time. Their cultures weren't just influenza. They were Bordetella and mycoplasma and a few other things. Um, um, in addition to that, many of them were older. They had other risk factors and whatsoever. But my point is, of all the 33 evil things that can by themselves trigger and cause canine kennel cough, of all those 33 things, Bordetella is the only organism that paralyzes the cilia. What are the cilia? Well, we're talking about little microscopic hairs, tiny little hairs that are on the top ends of the 
of the, the cells that line the trachea, line the windpipe, line the upper, up, uh, upper respiratory tract, all the way down through the main stem bronchi's bifurcation into the lower airways. They're little hairs that have, that whisk, are brushing, it's like the little sweepers that are moving crud that develops in the respiratory tract 24-7, 365 to keep you and me and your dog healthy. And when those are paralyzed, the crud, even the normal crud, that they're there because there's normal crud, folks, and they just get rid of it and you cough once or twice and you're just fine. Well, when those are paralyzed and you've got another infection, it's causing exudate and goo and crud in your, in your respiratory tract, and you can't get rid of it, and your pneumonia goes from pretty, pretty okay to a little bit worse and a little bit worse, and all of a sudden you can't breathe, that's a good reason to get your cilia working. And that's even a better reason never to have them stop working in the first place. And that's why Bordetel is one of Dr. B's core fives. Stop that lecture. So, risk management. Um, make sure your kids are healthy with, um, um, in all aspects, nutrition, exercise, examination, reduce their exposure as much as you can, avoid boarding if you can, avoid daycare for sure, avoid daycare, uh, I don't want to say it's a convenience, a lot of people depend upon daycare, Fido goes to daycare, they go to work, some people have to work, I respect that, but if you can avoid that or whatsoever, do that. Check out the daycares. There are 75 daycares within, I'm exaggerating now. There's, you'll know me, I love to exaggerate. There's 75 daycares within five miles of your house. Some of them have better sanitation protocols and screening protocols than others. So get on the phone, go inspect them, see, what, see if you can upgrade your daycare or whatever it, uh, whatever it takes. Um, practice social distancing whenever you can, whenever you're walking. Um, and make sure you stick with known healthy dogs, known healthy dogs. Uh, make sure your vaccinations are up to, Kate, uh, are up to date um, and use social distancing. A lost... There it is. Well, can't get. Uh, can't get my camera off of that. So um, no knows the no 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 knows the combat. Oh. oh, there it is. So no knows the combat. Uh, um, and then uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, which we'll which we already touched on fairly briefly, is uh, the relationship between health and disease and immunity. If you, um, if you have good, solid immunity and all of your things are in place and some big weight comes along, such as some evil disease, you still are maybe able to stay on top of the teeter-totter, on top of your game because of your good underlying good health. And part of that good underlying good health is in maintaining your, the the edge of being stayed in that balance of or ahead of the game when the when disease comes along is the ability to um, 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 not the ability to but making sure all your ducks are in row your vaccines are up to date and you have good stable health so um, what's happening um, today we've talked about what is kennel cough We've, we've, we've talked about the symptoms. We've talked about the outcomes. We've talked about um, um, what it takes to prevent it. Um, what's next? What's next? Well, 
I'm going to go out on the limb. I probably should end right here, take questions, and not, uh, and not predict what I think is going to happen over the next course of a couple months. But as you know, I've been doing this for decades and decades and decades and decades. And um, when I was, in, after I'd been in practice for five, seven, ten years, I can't remember, maybe 15, maybe 10, probably five, seven, ten years, somewhere about a, a good client. I, um, I still know her, a um, um, very uh, trusted uh, friend that I've, I won't use her name specifically, but she calls me up one day. Um, she has field flat coat retrievers. She does dog shows. She has champion dogs whatsoever. And she said, Dr. B, Dr. B, um, 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 Fido's got uh, killer kennel cough. And I said, um, um, Sally, not her name. Sally, what are you talking about? What do you mean by killer kennel cough? And she said, well, we went to this dog show whatsoever, and my three friends have got their dogs, and they're trying to, one, one of them died, one of them this, and, and uh, what, uh, I, what are we going to do? Well, I said, well, bring the kid in. We're going to fix him. So what she was talking about was a, an upper respiratory infection that went through a whole bunch of dogs at a dog show. Dog show, close contact, um, um, no social distancing, because uh, they, um, uh, and the like. What, does that sound familiar? It sounds like just what we're talking about here, right, folks? So, uh, and some of them died really rapidly. That's bad. Um, and so um, um, I looked at the dogs. We treated them as we did this. And they were sick for a little bit longer than maybe I expected. But they got better. They got just fine. And I started thinking, because when she said killer kennel cough and all of this stuff, something went through my mind, kind of a wahoo, because back in veterinary school, Ed Donovan, Ed Donovan, uh, my, one of my professors, Dr. Donovan, um, um, a great uh, person, great uh, mentor, super teacher, um, spent a lot of hours with him after, um, after everybody had gone home, kind of learning, sitting on his knees, uh, figuratively getting things. He could look at a dog from across the room in a cage and tell you what was wrong with it. I didn't have the time to uh, go through rounds. Um, I used to be, he's got this blood test and this blood test, and he was going to say, Christ, Bowers, no, that dog's got pancreatitis. Well, he told me, and he was right. That's what was exciting. Anyway, he told me, Bowersfeld, every seven years, there's going to be a respiratory infection that goes through the population. Dogs are going to get sick. More dogs are going to get sick than usual. What you need to do is use the protocols and use your good training, and you're going to make your patients better, and everything's going to be all right. I don't remember the circumstances that he told me, but when Cynthia said it's killer kennel cough to me on the phone, that picture flashed back in my mind from veterinary school maybe five, seven years before that. Wind back to, you know, I've been doing this for decades, folks. Every, my brain says every five, seven, eight years, seven plus or minus one or two, there's a wave of really bad kennel cough that goes through my practice. And, um, Ever since that time, I remember Diamond saying, do everything you can, do what you've been trained to do. We now have better training, we have better, maybe not better training, but we have more tests, more reliability, newer antibiotics, newer protocols, better things to diagnose, better things to treat with. And um, so my prediction is that we're in one of these waves, and um, if, that, if history is going to repeat itself, um, we're looking at two or three months and the whole process hopefully will die out. Um, that may be a prayer and not a promise, but that's been my experience, and I'm here to share with you what I can and the like. That doesn't mean we shouldn't take this situation lightly. Um, we're hearing about a bigger problem than we've ever heard of before, that we've got more media that's more interested in that. We've got more YouTube this. We've got more TikTok this. We've got more Instagram this. We've got more hype that's going on. Could could this big blip be the same seven-year cycle that's just being advertised? Yes. Could it be more significant? I don't know. I have no idea what, you know, 50% increase in, um, in pneumonia in, in the insurance companies. Seven years ago, <coughs> there weren't, weren't that many insurance companies. There are more and more now. What were the statistics then? I don't think we know. I don't think uh, we don't have a good handle on it, but I know the principles that I've given you today are going to suit you well and serve you well on keeping your dogs healthy and making you worry-free.
So with that, I'm going to check on questions and answers, um, your questions, my answers, and I don't, I was supposed to be able to figure out how to stream the questions across the bottom of the screen, but technology did not help me with that. Um, uh, Penny, hi Penny, how you doing? Well, it's good to see you, or good to hear from you. Penny asks, uh, um, <coughs> determine the difference between a cough due to allergies and the kennel cough. Yes, well, a cough due to allergies tends to be pretty um, I don't know, sporadic was the first adjective that came to my mind, kind of sprinkled through the course of, um, um, of the day, but the, the allergy cough is kind of a normal cough, <coughs> right? Um, the kennel cough cough is a loud croup um, very distinctive. I'll try to, maybe I'll try to record some dogs that are coughing uh, here, but if you ever, if, if, if you hear a cough that sounds like a normal cough, it's not, it's not the kennel cough cough. The other thing that you can do, <coughs> I need, water. So the other thing that you can do is kind of gently massage Fido's throat, kind of right in here, right in here. Good throat. Um, if you massage him right in here and you, you uh, put a little pressure on it, you can trigger the cough. That will never happen with, um, with an allergy cough. That will never happen with an allergy cough. And this is size related. A, a poodle, tiny little 10 pound thing, yes. Ernie's Mountain Dog, not 100% consistent. Uh, Kristen, hey Kristen, hey, how are you doing? I'm glad you, glad you could join us here today. Um, uh, Kristen says she's got a 16 or 17 year old kid. Um, he may be more susceptible should he come in contact with a dog who has it. Yes, he's gonna be susceptible because his risk factors of age are up, which means his his ability, his, his immune system is kind of lower, uh, just kind of like senior people. Their immune system's kind of lower. Um, the, the, the population, like for people, recognizes that with influenza, seniors get a double dose of the influenza vaccine, at the senior dose of the influenza vaccine as opposed to um, the normal dose. So yes, you should be more concerned and you should be escalating your precautions. And in your case, um, um, I know you do a lot of volunteer work, and that's really great, but I would probably, um, there's, we talk about fomites. Fomites are a surface like glasses, a surface like a cell phone, surface like a, a water bowl um, that might be able to harbor the infection and transmit it. Since we don't know what's a virus, we don't know what's a bacteria, we don't know what the cell surface is like, we don't really know how long it can last on a surface if a dog goes cough, can it stay there for five minutes, five weeks, or five hours? With COVID, it, uh, it needed a really shiny surface and something to hold it because a porous surface like a dog coat wasn't going to hold it. Um, so a, a, like a, a, a water bowl at a dog park, big risk. You going back and forth from, from um, from your volunteer work, might consider um, like keeping your shoe, use shoe covers at the, um, um, at the, you have to volunteer and take them off or use a separate pair of shoes, wash your hands uh, when you come into the house. Uh, Barb, Barb, hi Barb, great, glad you could be here. Oh, you got raccoons and possums. Um, as long as Sam doesn't go chasing them, I think you'll be fine. There's no evidence that the canine respir infectious respiratory disease complex is a problem for raccoons or opossums, particularly opossums. They're kind of a little entity all in themselves. The, raccoon <coughs> the raccoons are um, not known to be transmitting that, but I'm not a raccoon expert. But I can't imagine Sam being nose-to-nose uh, -nose with a raccoon without needing emergency care. So um, I think as long as you keep them away, you're gonna be fine. 
um, sweeter. Ah, um, great. Um, glad to have you here. Can, um, can this be contracted by my dog sniffing the area that a sick dog just sniffed just a few minutes prior? I'm going to say that's possible based upon what we've been talking about. The surface would have to have droplets on it as opposed to just air floating around. We know that kennel cough, classic kennel cough, is transmitted by air, air droplets in the air. So you've got a closed area that's high in humidity. Those droplets are going to stay there for a long period of time. Dogs walking in and out of that room are going to get exposed. So if you've got a water bowl or the, the, a ground service or something, and let's say the gall <coughs> coughs on it and spits on it, is there a aerosol stuff in the air? Well, if the wind's been blowing, probably not. If he, if he sniffs on it and licks it, well, dogs like to lick, and a lot of times you don't know uh, how, how the, 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 the target distance between tongue and surface is. So if they lick it, I think there's a possibility. But for sure, the, the breathing type thing, dogs greeting each other and kind of, you know, Two dogs kind of greeting each other, circling. When they come up and they go, they're mouthing each other and, 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 and exchanging saliva samples. There's a risk of exposure, in my opinion. Um, Adam, uh, you made it. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, my dog has this, hasn't been for a month. Meds didn't help. Um, um, couple questions to either check with your vet or whatsoever. If he's had it for a month, needs to get a good culture and pr uh, probably the DNA test uh, um, screen to make sure he doesn't have one of the other things. Because cl classic kennel cough, if it gets one of the other 33 things in its system and it gets a low-grade walking pneumonia and the bacteria gets set on, and your dog's old enough not to shed it off or not healthy enough to shed it off, he could have old-fashioned kennel cough with just the bacteria. The, the new stuff that's had it for a month, the good news is you're probably, probably going to be in the, in the group where they're going to be last for a month and a month and a month and then get better as opposed for the month, the ones to get. Um, so the longer they have it, the better chances you are that it's going to be chronic and hopefully long-term asymptomatic, but we don't know that for sure. But if he's had it for a month and he's still coughing, I get a culture and make sure you don't have something that you can really treat and try to knock out. The, um, that, um, I'll come back to that in a second. That really triggered up. Um, I've got, um, um, thank you for your presentation. We are very, very welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be here and blessed to be sharing with you. Oh, Adam again, the, been giving him unfiltered honey, green tea, slippery elm, good or bad? Uh, that's pretty good. Honey is, um, a, a green tea is a great immune stimulant, a great, um, a slow, a sl so is slippery elm. You might check the herbal remedies, most people poo-poo. Um, I have a big respect for herbal remedies. The problem with herbal remedies is that the um, concentration of them is um, the compounding of them be, can be off the wall, and if you and they can be so potent and strong that you can have some some side effects. Diarrhea, vomiting would be the first, actually. So if you're not getting that issue, I don't think that's a problem. Honey, it, you want to make sure it's natural unprocessed honey as opposed to some of the stuff that's pasteurized or whatsoever that's in the um, that's in a lot of the stores get it from mother or get it from a good health food store and you'll you're going to probably be good but that um, if and that's for cough per se although it is going to help the kids immune system the cough if that's not helping the cough per se you might need to get on this some pre prescription medication Robitussin CF over-the-counter, CF stands for cough formula, cough, um, cough formula, which has dextromethorphan in it, uh, was a, is a good thing. To, I don't know how big your kid is, but a 30-pound dog, a tablespoon, a good swallow, two, three times a day, very safe, very effective. 
Um, you can go up on that or go down from that. Bernie's Mountain Dog, two swallows. Uh, um, um, of course, chihuahuas swallow less, so one swallow for a chihuahua, that would work out really well. Um, please talk about chloramphenicol's role in the treatment of this infection. Um, several people have been, chloramphenicol, chloramphenicol is, um, so the question is chloramphenicols in the treatment of, we'll call it atypical candle cough. Um, many people are using chloramphenicols. Chloramphenicol is a great antibiotic. It is not a popular antibiotic anymore uh, for a lot of different reasons. But uh, for sure, chloramphenicol is being used by some people as a first line of defense. Um, I personally treated two, and I've been back from the trip um, for three to two days, and two people call up with, with coughing dogs that have been coughing for three months, strike that three weeks, when waiting for me to come back. I kind of slapped their hand um, because I should have seen urgent care, but they didn't. And um, one of them I started on chloramphenicol based upon what I could read uh, and glean at the time. That was pretty ineffective. Chloramphenicol is a bacteriostatic uh, antibiotic. It stops the growth. It doesn't, it's not bactericidal, which means it kills them. That's one reason it's become less, than, um, um, less popular. Um, when I graduated from Ohio State, chloramphenicol, I had gallons of it. It's a, actually, there was a palmitate was a liquid, too. I had gallons of it on the shelf, first and second choice for upper respiratory, first and second choice for skin infections. It was, it was a wonder drug for 10, 15 years. Um, skin infections started getting um, resistant to it. Other things came into play that were more effective. It got some bad press because uh, in people, it was we're talking about decades, a long time ago. It was used in people, and then the, the bad press was it was producing blood dyscrasias, bone marrow dyscrasias, bone marrow depression in people, bone marrow depression in people. The drug is extremely safe in the canine, extremely safe in the feline. So um, it, I like the drug, and I, uh, I actually put one patient on it. The cultures didn't support that, and I changed it to something supportive on the cultures. But uh, that's a really good question because you, um, the, the, the press, the literature whatsoever are, are cranking out, this works, this doesn't work whatsoever. Um, we're, uh, I see those. I try to go to the source and find out what really was used, what wasn't used, and incorporate that uh, ongoing to improve the protocols for my patients if I can. But that's a really good question. Um, Barb. Thank you, he says thank you. you uh, you're very, very welcome. Kristen says thank you um, for the information. We'll be went in tomorrow. Um, Adam uh, says extremely grateful. Thank you. Um, anything else I can help you with if the, when the thing, uh, when the uh, broadcast uh, eventually terminates, you can put in the comments. I'd love for you to put in a comment. Uh, um, um, if you could share a comment on um, your experiences with this. If you have any personal experiences like it, Adam with his, um, um, uh, or your neighbors, I've seen your neighbors whatsoever, if you could put those in the comments because I'm really trying to get a handle on what's going on uh, with this. But I'm, I'm uh, blessed to be here and be able to share with you today, and I'm blessed to have you guys participating. And um, uh, let me double check one more time for any more questions that are coming through. I don't see any. So um, with that, I want to thank you all for uh, your participant for your questions. Thank you all for your attention and thank you all for caring enough for your pets to be here and to get good, solid, helpful information to keep your pets healthy keep them on the track for as long as uh, God intended them to be, and uh, we'll be here to help you any way we can. Thanks for joining me here today. This is Dr. B signing off. Thanks. Thank you so much.